Everybody listen to We Are Not Wizards. Because we are the best. And we're not wizards. No matter what anybody says. Goodbye. A wizard is never late. He arrives precisely when he means to. Hello and welcome to another episode of We're Not Wizards. My name's Richard. I'll be your host for July. <laughs> I know. It's like the summer's here. It's quite sad, actually, because we actually crossed into the part of the summer where the days start to get shorter again because we've passed the equinox. So, you know, um, you can't, you just have to get on with things. In some in some ways you can't, you, you have to just seize the initiative. I would say in many ways you just can't wait. So with that in mind, <laughs> <laughs> there's only one thing to do. If you can't wait, don't wait. But get Pete wait. On the show. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's terrible. It's potentially the it's potentially the forty seventh worst introduction that I've done. <laughs> but um hey Pete, how are you? How are you? I'm I'm good, thank you, Richard. I'm I'm good. Yeah. I'm delight yeah. I'm actually delighted I'm beside myself that you're on. Because oh. cause this is one of those things where it's like you don't have a game to talk about you don't have a Kickstarter project to talk about. You don't have anything to promote. You're just <laughs> on here to have a chat. Because uh, first of all, big, well, big thank you for continuing to to listen to my stupid ramblings. And now you'll be five minutes in, you'll be going, "Oh, why did I say I was going to come on?" <laughs> um, but you've been, I mean, you've been a listener for a while, and um, surprisingly enough, I think we first. We've been talking kind of on and off, and I think the major kind of thing was the Frank West episode, the robot voice episode, where he just said, uh, yes, yes. He just says, I can't, <laughs> I can't listen to this, it's too robot voicey, and I was like that. I'm really, really, I sent you a message saying, I'm really, really sorry, um, we did what we could do. And then that kind of moved on from there, and, um, uh-huh. and then we've been talking and trying to get this scheduled in, and finally... You are here. here. You're here? Yeah. yeah. So, so how are you? I'm good. I'm good. That was, that was a great intro, by the way. I've not, not heard that uh, that at all, ever, ever. No one's ever used my name like that before. <laughs> I, <laughs> ever. I'm pretty sure that's not the case. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, that, that, that wasn't true. brought up in kind of primary school, if not... <laughs> If not, well, nursery. if not, if not before, yeah, my my parents must have had a, a tremendous sense of humour um, <laughs> because they they gave me the middle name Barnaby. Wow, uh, which which is, is in its own right um, bordering on abuse, but um, <laughs> the uh, having the middle initial B um, doesn't really help when your surname's Waite because as soon as you start doing chemistry at school, yeah. you learn that the chemical symbol for lead. Yes. Is PB. Yes. So there I was, PB weight. <laughs> Lead weight. So um, I, I was I was set up um, from a very early age, I think. Set up for life. Set up to be a foe. Did you, did you become the class comedian from then? Is that when you kind of first discovered your roots of making people laugh by just I, writing, yeah. writing your name on the blackboard and just going, look, it's funny. But then having to explain about the chemical, the chemical kind of symbol... For no, I, I, I think the uh, the humour as a defence uh, thing <laughs> probably started there, um, and I've been defending myself avidly since then. Really, um, you know, I think um, 
I think you just have to continue to do that. You know, I think um, as soon as I spoke to you, I think there's a number of things we have to discuss where I want you to kind of, uh, I need you to defend yourself. In fact, it was almost like, <laughs> it was almost like you wanted to, to, to do, to do this because you sent me and I am actually going to, I'm going to hold you to high esteem for this because nobody else has done this so far, which is to actually send me a list of things that you have done. Everybody else that comes on the show, they expect me to kind of look at their Twitter feed and look at their social media and find out about them and their business and their creativity and stuff like that. You, sir, put together a CV. <laughs> it's, a cra- it's a cracking one as well. It's an actual, it's an actual cracking one. Um, I guess we should do like the proper kind of admin stay and say, you know, for people that haven't heard the show for the first time, thank you for coming along. The reason that we do this is because um, it's almost at episode 300 and if I stop now, it's just rude. And, you know, also I like I like doing it. And if you like doing something and as long as it isn't illegal, um, then you just keep on doing it. And the second reason is, as I say, me and Pete have been talking kind of back and forward for a little while now. And um, I've been trying to get him on the show and it's just been organising it. And now he's on. So we're going to have a chat. Um so you're born in Devon, yeah. But you stay. You you obviously you stay in kind of Nottingham now. So did you have you did you spend most of your young life kind of in Devon? Was that kind of like your stomping ground? Kind of Absolutely, thing? yeah. Um, born in Tiverton, which was the was the, probably still is the dead centre of Devon. Um, emphasis on the dead. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so I I, I spent. Um, 18 years there, essentially, till I uh, fell out of the back end of the school, having failed my A-levels. Oh, right. Um, I managed to find a, a job up in Coventry, which was, um, bizarrely, it was a, a company that were advertising for A-level failures. <laughs> okay. Um, which was great. Which was It was quite clever of them, really, because they were looking for people who um, just weren't very good at exams, um, but but had the sort of savvy to to do a job sort of thing. Um, so I, I took to that, um, was in Coventry for several years, and then the job moved to Nottingham, and that's where I've been. So You said telecoms? So you must have seen a change. I mean, is this software, oh, is this yeah. software yeah. kind of hardware tuned to software? Because if I remember, t- I mean, I suppose if we say 30, you know, 30, 40 odd years, in telecoms, and this was what I saw on Twitter recently saying that time is a strange thing because, you know, 1970 was like, is like 50 years ago now, basically, yeah. almost. Yeah. So yeah. you are kind of looking at, it's not, you're looking at the beginning of the 80s where it's like kind of a start of privatization and stuff like that. BT going to the, getting sold and everything kind of along those lines. So yeah. you... Were you working with them, or were you working? Were you working for kind of like the still working for the private company at the time? Well, yeah, I was working for GEC, um, mm. General Electric Company, in the uh, private telephone exchange All right. side of it. So um, companies bought their telephone exchanges um, from BT, mm-hmm. and we made G, both GEC and a company called Plessy mm-hmm. um, made the were like the two main suppliers into to BT. And it was like a blank, almost like a blank check every year. They come back and all, all, the, all the company had to do was say, how many do you want this year? So really? And then, then um, um, Margaret Thatcher turned up and oh. uh, everything was deregulated, privatized and open to competition. And that was the beginning of the end really for that uh, that side of the business, and then sort of technology moved on as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've been, well, I say we, um, been redundant for the last three years, but up, right. up until that point, we were sort of riding the technology wave from mm-hmm. the the early days with the sort of electromechanical telephone exchanges right through to the um, voice over IP like we're doing here, you know, Skype sort of deal. So you actually kind of picking me up on whether how how good or how bad I am at using this type of software, and are you going to kind of mark me a ten at the no, end? I wouldn't dream of and that. See your no. career levels and stuff like that. <laughs> no, 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 nothing like that. So, so you won't get that from me. 
I mean, when it comes to kind of like, because you you say you kind of you do listen to kind of like a few pro- podcasts, then do you look? Do you ever look at them from a kind of a technical point of view? Then do you ever kind of look at them from, oh, well, what's wrong with this one? What's wrong with that one? Kind of thing. <laughs> I I am very aware of, um, of of the various problems that that certain podcasters appear to have with. Mm-hmm. I, I I commented on it in, uh, in a post about um, watching the levels. Yeah, um, which is something that you're very good at doing, um, but but other people you can have one side of the conversation is really quiet and then the guest is incredibly loud. Um, I, I try to listen to pod, well, I don't try to I, I mostly listen to podcasts in the car when I have yeah. time yeah. to listen to, them. and uh, I can't be riding the volume knob on in the car while no. I'm supposed to be driving. Yeah, so, yeah. And that's why I had that problem with that particular Frank West uh, episode because <laughs> because he was suddenly barking very loudly occasionally. It, it was blowing my speakers out. So. It was. He said at the time it was because he was in the middle of moving house and he didn't have his normal his kind of normal setup going. And we were both confused because he was filming a lot of YouTube videos at the time, and his sound was always crystal clear. And then I think he actually said at the time on the episode, we got kind of like 35 minutes in it, because I think these levels are just like all over the place. He says, I don't know how bad this is going to be. And I was like, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. And then, of course, I played it back, and it's one of these things where you're like, it's like the whole thing about podcasting is that if you become complacent at it, it's that one time that you become complacent at it that you kind of, that's when... It all goes to pot, and you end up with an episode that you've got, like, kind of, I don't know, kind of spend five or six hours trying to piece together and kind of edit, edit kind of properly. <laughs> um, with relation to you and the hobby, because obviously uh-huh. we've got to mention it, we can't just talk about, you know, um, playing trumpet in the Albert Hall, but we will get around to it. <laughs> um, I mean, how did you how did you first kind of cut your teeth on the hobby? Kind of what kind of first kind of got you involved? Uh, well, yeah, I guess it goes back to the family, um, the family days of playing playing games. Had a, an older brother, um, mm-hmm. obviously, well, mum and dad, and uh, we had various roll and move games, uh, but we didn't actually have a copy of Monopoly. Uh, so uh, my dad made one for us. Um, <laughs> completely from scratch made the board um, hand wrote all the cards um, cut out blank cards and hand wrote all the property cards out all the chance community chest things I sent you a photo of my uh, you did my send me a photo and this thing is just <laughs> yeah I mean this thing um, is absolutely uh, amazing it is going to be it is pretty much going to be the cover photo for the episode <laughs> I've decided already because it's like the de- the dedication <laughs> the dedication to this is outstanding and, and people are going to go oh yeah how good is it and it's like the money alone <laughs> the length of time because it's not just the case it's not like it's actually the colours of paper match <laughs> the colours of paper actually match the proper colours or at least like they match the proper colours the colours are just fantastic. And it's not it's the attention to detail on the artwork as well, because it looks like he's gone in and actually drawn the individual lines for all the money and all the individual properties and and everything like that. Do you still yeah. have the set? Yes, indeed. Yeah, I took, I took that photo um when I knew I was coming on the show. It's, wow. it's upstairs. Yeah. It's, I mean that, the, the the hotels and houses were just sort of Lego pieces uh-huh. um so he didn't actually hand craft the <laughs> the components but uh, but I, th- I think he would have because he, he was he was a, the sort of guy that would go that extra mile to uh, to make something uh really good where did he get where did he get all the information from then did he borrow somebody else's set and then yes yeah he did he, he borrowed, borrowed a, a work colleague's copy and uh I'm sure there's a, a Waddington's lawyer somewhere who's uh, sharpening his pencil, <laughs> thinking, "Aha! Somebody's pirated a copy of this game." So. I'm sure you've. I'm sure you're giving your money back. I'm sure you've probably <laughs> bought. I mean, is it? 
I mean, this is a this is. I mean, I am as I say, you're going to see a picture of this when you listen to the episode because it's going to be on like it's going to be the artwork for the show notes <laughs> basically because it does look absolutely fantastic. But did you were you were you playing this kind of all the time? Then we, we did play. We did play it a lot. Yeah, because we didn't have uh, we didn't have a, a Calax full of games back then. Mm. Um, we just really had uh, had that. Um, and then moved on to things like Cluedo, mm-hmm. and um, there were other games which, because um, I, I got quite fascinated by the um, the concept of board games from, mm-hmm. that, from that point, um, and we started looking at uh, games that were not so linear, not yeah. like just moving around a track. Um, there was a game called Minor Million. I don't know if you ever ever saw that. It's quite old. It rings a bell. Um, we still still got it. But it was a, a game where you basically uh, produced um, material at your mine, and then uh-huh. uh, tr- transported it to uh, to where you could sell it. It was a sort of um, pick up and deliver type sort of game. Um, but there was there was more than one way to go, yeah. um, which is what attracted us. There was another game called Exploration, which I think was also Waddington's, uh, which. You move around the outside track to sort of get your equipment for your expedition, and then you moved into the centre, which was just oh, really? a, an open world sort of grid, and it had a, a peculiar dice, which um, wasn't a one to six. It had um, icons on the side to, to represent different sorts of moves in the in the world area in the middle of the map, and that kind of that really sparked your imagination as a, a young youngster playing games like that. With um, with your dad inventing, well, copying, not inventing Monopoly, um, but copying Monopoly, did that lead you to kind of start making stuff yourself on occasion? Were you there with like a, a pair of scissors and some PVA glue and some <laughs> felt tips and making up some your occasional kind of own versions of games? Or Yeah, we, we, we did a, a little bit of that. Um, my brother, who was uh, a bit older than me, he was, mm. he was more into... Um, Dungeons and Dragons and that that side of it, mm-hmm. which was uh, obviously a lot more um, creative in terms of uh, imagination, if you like. Um, but I, I did. Uh, I had a, a a summer and after school job at a local fruit and veg shop, so I tried to make a game out wow. of the process of selling fruit and veg, um, which was absolutely terrible, as per <laughs> your infamous tweet. Um, but it, it was my first attempt at a game, um, and I, I think it was inspired by that, that uh, monopoly effort by my dad. It, it was, it, and I think I've sort of carried on that kind of concept of if, if you if you can think of something, you can probably make it. Did you have a lot of money growing up? Then was it quite a tight kind of family in terms oh, of? Oh no, yeah, there was there was, there was uh, not very much money at all around. To be honest. Mum was working two jobs, so, uh-huh. so I mean we weren't we weren't badly off. It wasn't um, you know a handful of gravel for breakfast and all that sort of stuff. It was uh, <laughs> you had a handful. Really, you were lucky. <laughs> <laughs> you tell the kids today yeah. exactly. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean we weren't we weren't horribly off, um, but we weren't sort of buying buying stuff whenever we wanted it either. Mm. I don't know. I think it's the same. A lot of People I know growing up, everybody was the same, but you kind of, you kind of made do at the time. I think, you know, what I noticed, and this is going to make me sound old, is, and I was discussing this a couple of weeks ago with the guys in the office, is that we don't, we don't fix a lot of stuff nowadays. <laughs> you know, I remember, and the other thing we joked about, we joked about up in, um, up in Scotland and Glasgow time, there was, there was, um, you had like radio rentals, but you also had a Scottish kind of TV rental company called Glens, Hutchison's, Robertson's and Stepek. And they used to get the advert on the telly, which was, you know, <laughs> and it used to be like, they used to have silver, right? And they used to go, Glens, Hutchison's, Robertson's and Stepek. And you can rent this. And it was like 21 inch full color TV, <laughs> you know, with, and it had the, it had the buttons. You could tell it was posh because the buttons were kind of like a silver plastic, and it actually had, it actually had BBC One, BBC Two, ITV, and and then the, the really the really better ones had Channel Four on there as well. 
and wow. you know you could you could click the buttons and stuff like that. And it used to get like TV repair guys coming out, and I remember we, I don't know about you, but I remember our telly broke breaking and them getting a TV repair guy to come out and actually look at it and go, oh, looks, the valve's gone. <laughs> the guy yeah, coming yeah, in, absolutely. The guy coming in yeah, and repairing the valve, and I was just, we just like <laughs> thinking about that. Is if that was nowadays, people kind of like I've seen people kind of dump stuff that is kind of like they, they, they're dumping it because they've, they've got a newer one, not because the other one's kind of broken. And I've just aged myself by about twenty years. But <laughs> well, no, we, we had uh, we had the very similar experience with the, the televisions back in back in the day because the first one we had, you had to tune with a, a dial. <sighs> You know, it's I had before that. the the pre selected buttons, but each of those oh, yeah. buttons was a was a tuner, wasn't it? So you you could you could tune that it was to like preset. So, preset it, and um, then you press the button. And but yeah, I remember that because um, yeah. when my my great aunt she had a small black and white TV in her bedroom, and she had one in her living room. When she passed away, me and my brother got these TVs, and you had to dial them so. At the time, this is like nostalgia hour on the show. But at the time, <laughs> Rice Rice Krispies were doing these um, sticker sets, so that every pack there was like a sticker that was full of like all letters of the alphabet, just for you to make stuff up and things like that. So you used to have the little tiny stickers, and we used to place them round the dials where you could find all the <laughs> where you could find all the various channels. So you couldn't kind of you couldn't kind of kind of lose them that was you know that was the that was the kind of the kind of the way um when you were doing your days of your courting and stuff like that was the board did the board games go to one side i mean you did you continue you know did you continue kind of um rolling while you were spooning i guess (laughs) (laughs) no no um I, i think um the, the fascination with board games took a took a huge break when I uh, when I had to move from Devon up to the Midlands to to work because mm-hmm. um, a, a lot of the time I was playing games with my friends in in Devon or with my with the family mm-hmm. um, and uh, when I moved to Coventry it was uh, it was all um, sort of a different set and nobody was playing board games so we were all sort of like you say discovering discovering other things like. <laughs> beer and, and so on other other pastimes like um, so, like um, playing trumpet <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well I mean, that 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 again was um, something that took a break when uh, when I left Tiverton because uh, my my glory days of playing the trumpet at the Albert Hall was uh, was um, by virtue of the guy that ran the Tiverton Youth Orchestra all right and uh, he hired <laughs> he hired the Royal Albert Hall for his or his little local orchestra to play in. Really? Yeah, yeah. And so he, he got I think it was five five coaches worth of uh, of orchestra and family and friends, and we we drove up there and took over the place for a few hours in an afternoon. That's amazing. And, uh, yeah. You sent me the actual program. Here you go. It's, and I've seen you. You're in the trumpet section. <laughs> and well, it, it's it, it's not actually the program. It's the sleeve of a vinyl record. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you remember those? <laughs> I, I just I think I think we're we're going to lose the young crowd here. They're going to be saying, "Well, so how do you how do you get how many MP3s do you get in an album?" Then it's like you don't. They're made out of vinyl. So how does that work then? Is that a fashion <laughs> thing? It's like, no. But then again, if you think about it, a lot of the, the younger folk are like, oh, you should see these vinyl albums you get in Tesco's because they've started selling yeah. vinyl again. So yeah, you can buy back. it all. They're back, yeah. You For know? some bizarre reason, people seem to think it's it's good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which, I mean, I've, I've got two shelves of, of albums in the next in the next room that I bought back yeah. in the sort of 70s onwards. Um, yeah. They're all... To each one of them is absolutely knackered because I, I didn't take care of them. They come mm. in scratches, and uh, and it, it's a, it's a terrible medium for if you think about it. You're, you're scratching very delicate grooves into a, a bendy plastic thing that doesn't like heat, and uh, and you, you sort of play it once and it's already ruined. Yeah, I know. Um, 
but it, it's, it's meant to be warm. Fun, it's meant to be warm, though. I mean, that's what people love about it. They, everybody talks about the warm yeah. sound of vinyl. Yeah. Well, my, my ears don't really pick. I mean, I, I know that a really good system does sound fantastic. Mm. Um, but a really good system with a, a high quality digital file sounds fantastic as well. So it's, um, it's not for me, but all that care. I can't be doing with that. Did you not have, um, did you not have the separates? I, d- I did have, um, back in the day, but, uh, as soon as as soon as CDs came out, I was uh, sort of transformed uh, a little bit. I went to a, I, I got a portable CD player and wow. um, never really bothered with the home hi-fi after that. Are you still? I mean, are you still play? Would you go back to the trumpet? Have you gone back to the trumpet? Have you gone past the kind of like you know the old music shops or occasionally for some reason like used to get them in cash generator and stuff like that you used to see in a window an old trumpet used to kind of like turn up were you oh, ever yeah. tempted to go back in and kind of delve Not back really. in again no no it was, it was um it, it took a lot of a lot of practice i mean i only got to grade i can't remember what i got to grade five so mm. it wasn't um and it, it was great fun but I, I wasn't serious enough about practicing to uh to keep it up, um, and of course these days, if I want to, if I want a trumpet sound, I just load it into the keyboard, and there it is. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so you got I, a keyboard I, I, now, have you? Oh gosh, yes. I um, I, I've dabbled in the music side of things quite a lot. Um, so I've amassed a small arsenal of uh, weapons against proper music. <laughs> because uh, and this is a quick aside when. Jake was on the show. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we did yeah. a whole thing of a hip hop. Uh-huh. uh-huh. And then you went and kind of dropped this track into <laughs> the, into my inbox. <laughs> and did a full kind of like turned it into a rap battle. <laughs> which yep. sounded absolutely fantastic. And you had all the beats and stuff like that. I was just like, I just might as well go home. <laughs> There's no point. Yeah, that was that was completely out of my comfort zone. That was. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what what it was about you that inspired me to do that. But I've I've no idea because it like completely because <laughs> like I was I remember speaking to Jake on DMs and just saying, "Look, <laughs> Pete sent me a track," and he's like, "What?" He's <laughs> just say "What?" and I was like, "Yeah, I'll send it to you." And he's come out and he's going, "He's got bars," and I was like, "Yeah, he has." Because I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to step up my game here. And then obviously we sent our stuff to Jake, and he then came across with this ridiculous yeah, kind of follow yeah. up, you know, blow us out the water kind well, of yeah, rap I mean, track. It is, it is Wimbledon season, and that was a real um, smash from him, wasn't it? He, thought, yeah. <laughs> yeah. he, he put, put the put the ball into Road J. You know, we weren't we weren't going to get that exactly. <laughs> That's just like thinking that we're beyond Borgen, like uh, Jimmy Connor or whatever, and he's rocking up with Novak Djokovic. <laughs> we're just yes, like, going, yeah. okay, then we'll have a we'll have a seat. We'll sit down, <laughs> like kind of like kind of good like kind of good guys. Um, yeah. In terms of like. Um, the games that you're playing now, uh-huh. are you? Is it easy to keep up with it? Is it easy to kind of keep up with the scene? I mean, do you generally stick with a couple of games, or are you? You know, obviously, with the advent of social media being the way that it is, it's kind of like the new hotness. What's this week's kind of new hotness? Are you quite selective about the kind of the games that you'd get and bring to the table? Or have you? Or are you quite a collector? Uh, I'm not really a collector. No, I mean I do. I do all of my gaming um, with my lady wife. Um, so you know, we're very uh, similar to Rado and Jennifer Ham. Yeah, Richard and Jennifer. They 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 play um, only only really play two player games and mm. not much of a take that component to it. So um, we we tend to seek out games that are well suited for us um in that score but i do i do keep up um with what's happening because uh, i think it was a couple of years ago when we we really started getting back into to playing board games because of our son-in-law 
Um, <coughs> he'd been watching um, Will Wheaton's tabletop oh, yeah. um, show, and he he sort of mentioned that he, he quite liked playing board games. So we started playing uh, with them, and suddenly sort of became aware of uh, all the other games that were around. And in particular, my wife had a, a conversation with somebody on a on a train um, on the way to work, um, and the made that found out about um, co- uh, cooperative games, um, which we'd never really heard of before. No, uh, so we got into uh, the sort of Forgotten Island, Forgotten Desert um, series of games. Um, and that sort of opened our eyes to things like Catan and Carcassonne, uh, Ticket to Ride, and that sort of thing. So we, we sort of bought all of those. Mm. Um, but then sort of started to pay attention to um, podcasts. Um, and that's where we discovered Your Good Self and uh, one or two others. Um, and through that, I really sort of keep up to date with, with what's going on. Um, I didn't have a board game geek account until then, <laughs> um, and we sort of uh, we're fairly selective. We, we don't uh, we don't just buy buy stuff to see what it's like. We yeah, sort of do do the research first, and we sort of dipped a toe into Kickstarter um, again because of you. Um, <laughs> with uh, you, you were talking, I'm feeling to, a lot of blame. Yeah, yeah. I'm feeling absolutely. currently a lot of blame, and I'm just telling you right now, right? There's no guilt coming back the way. No, no, quite right too. You know, uh, you, you had um, Dylan uh, from um, Quality Based on talking yes. about seize the bean. Yes, and uh, we got we really got quite excited about that. So we we did our first ever uh, Kickstarter campaign for that. Um, Still waiting for it. Um, it was it was meant to be meant to be around October last year. I'm just kind of uh, um, I'm kind of worried that I'm going to have to send it back and ask for a warm one. <laughs> <laughs> when it kind of turns when it kind of turns up. But in, um, in the meantime, we we sort of backed um, microbrew uh, again because you spoke to somebody, um, Nigel. Uh, yeah. And Tiny Epic Tactics, uh, we've, we've got coming. Um, that might, so that, both of those might arrive before uh, Seize the Bean finally does. But uh, looking forward to it. It's, I mean, are you, is it strange to kind of like be backing on stuff that you've not got? If I mean, it sounds to me like if you're select you as as you say you don't sound to me like the type of people that will just let's go and buy this game so we've got it on the shelf because we have it because we know it's good you sound like the type of person that we're going to put the money down on this if we know we're actually going to play it because otherwise it is pretty much a waste of money unless the kind of like the the family come round and we decide to kind of play it instead yeah yeah indeed i mean you you can pick up a lot from uh from the Kickstarter campaign and all the comments and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not really a blind purchase, but you, you do wonder if you'll still be excited about it when it when it arrives. Um, well, I mean, is there certain things that attract you on the campaign? I mean, is the co-op, does it have to have, is the co-op element, I take it, is one of the, is one of the main things? I mean, is there s- stuff on Kickstarter you maybe would never have actually picked up at retail? Well, yeah, there's there's plenty of stuff on there which we wouldn't we wouldn't really pick up, but it's um, I think what really attracts attracts me particularly more is the um, it's it's the sort of uh, artworks, um, not not so much the art, but the iconography. Mm. Um, mm. I remember a long time ago um, lusting after a, a, a copy of uh, Escape from Colditz. Yes. Uh, the infamously repackaged game, um, which had uh, a lot of iconography in it. There was a lot of graphical um, stuff in the game. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it it was it wasn't anything to do with the gameplay that attracted me. It was it was all the stuff in the box. Yeah, um, the, the board and, and the cards and all that sort of stuff. So I am quite drawn to 
um, nicely presented uh, games. Um, we recently got uh, Tio Tehuacan, uh, City of the Gods. Um, oh, yeah, Steve loves that game. He like he's, yeah, he's constantly trying to get me to play it, and it's like, oh, and you put <laughs> it on the board, and it's kind of like struck me as a little bit of mahjong just in the presentation with all the tiles and stuff like that. Obviously, it doesn't yeah, play like mahjong yeah. in any way, shape, or form, but I looked at it and I liked uh, I really liked um, its presentation, and it looks uh, it looks fun. I take it as, as excellent to play because I've heard nothing but really good, really good things about it. Absolutely, yeah, it, it is great. Has, I mean, have you ended up kind of getting more involved in the not just playing them, but getting kind of more involved in the kind of the hobby yourself in terms of actually I, starting to kind of do things, take action, kind of things like that? <laughs> um, yeah, a little bit. Um, I guess, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, it was, uh, I was made redundant three years ago, so I've mm. been at a little bit of a loose end, um, just operating a, a spousal taxi to, uh, to take my wife to work and back. Um, which doesn't pay very well, but uh, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> better not let her hear yeah. that. <laughs> I'm looking for the daggers. I think I'm safe. Yeah, it's alright. Um, you'll be fine. As long as she doesn't <laughs> listen to the show, <laughs> and you could just say, "Oh no, sorry, honey, the the file got um file got corrupted, and unfortunately yeah, he's not been able to hear it. It just keeps <laughs> on. Every time I try and download it, it keeps just getting deleted." You know, especially round about the image, <laughs> round about the 38, 38 minute mark, just completely goes. <laughs> no idea what's wrong. But um, yeah, to to get back to the question, the mm. um, hastily the, uh, <laughs> the the spare time that I've got now, let, let me sort of pay a bit more attention to um, to some some of the campaigns. So I've, I've managed to get a little bit involved with the uh, Welcome to Dino World. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Campaign just in terms of uh, playtesting and proofreading the rule book, uh, which was, uh, was a very interesting process because uh, there was a little bit of a back and forth with uh, Cesar and the, and the guys um, just on the on the mechanics of the game, which was a fascinating process. I really enjoyed that. Did it make you want to kind of get involved with other things? I mean, because I, I know that from a lot of designers' point of view, I mean. Um, um, Petter at Tompet Games was just saying, "Hey, does anybody want to reread? You know, look over the rule book for Donning the Purple." And I think mm-hmm. uh, there's a lot of guys out there that would appreciate, you know, having their kind of their games, their rule books, kind of looked over. Yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, it, it's it's something I, I wouldn't mind doing. Mm-hmm. But obviously, it'd be, it'd be quite nice to monetize it, and that's when it starts to get. Uh, Starts to get difficult. It's obviously nobody's um, nobody's hiring nobody's hiring a pedant uh, these days. Right. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It becomes it's kind of going it getting that fine line between it becoming a favour to it becoming. Well, actually, I've spent kind of eight and a half hours on this. Is there any way you can <laughs> <laughs> can it help contribute towards my uh, towards my time? Seeing as I, you know found that glaring area error that um would have otherwise broken the game. Um I'm not saying anything. Um but uh, you know, the the you kinda go but you, you sit you know, you put on you put in the notes that you've also you've been writing articles for the, the board game crate kind of newsletter yeah, as well. That's that's a very tiny, tiny thing really, but that's a, there's been two two articles accepted so far, mm. which is uh, which wasn't really something I was planning on doing, but um, we, we were subscribers at the time, and they put out a call for people to write articles, so I just fired up Word, and before I knew it, I had 500 <laughs> words in front of me. I thought, well, I'll send that over and see what they think, and there it was, accepted. So that was quite fun. Is it, I mean, would you like to do more stuff then? I mean, would you like to kind of get more involved? I mean, if people are listening along... Tonight, and we do get a fair number of kind of like the creative types out there. I mean, is it something you would like to you would like to get kind of more involved in with like the the rules, play testing things like that? Yeah, to 
to a certain extent, I think so. Yeah. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm not really involved in it that much, so I'm not sure what kind of Pandora's box you'd be opening by saying, "Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to do that." <laughs> well, if you're listening but, now, uh, obviously, as we said, Pete is, you, you know, he's he's sitting around. <laughs> Um, send them all your rule books um, give them money <laughs> and he'll guarantee that he'll make them look absolutely fantastic um, I'm uh, saying on. this with my fingers <laughs> saying this with my fingers crossed kind of <clears throat> obviously um, <clears throat> you did the centrepieces um, which I'm looking at just now for your daughter's wedding so you're quite creative. Indeed. I, I like to think so, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I'm really struggling to decide whether or now to put the picture of the Monopoly up or put the picture of these centrepieces in as well because they both look <laughs> kind of fantastic. Do you go ahead? Do you ever pimp up your board games then? Do you ever do um, that? Yeah, I do tend to go a little bit over the top if there's a print <laughs> and play uh, around. Yeah. Um, because uh, there, there have been one or two, um, but like the early versions of um, Dino World were, were, were print and play um, mm-hmm. things. So I, I was um, printing the cards double sided and laminating them and rounding the corners on them, <laughs> and uh, like making it making it all a bit a bit better than it really needed to be. Uh, it's kind of like people are going to see that and go, "Where'd you get that from? Is that the deluxe version?" It's like no. <laughs> I just did that myself. I'd love to see what you would do with something like um, terraforming Mars. <laughs> well, I, I, to be honest, I've never played it, um, so I, I don't know which side of the um, which side of the Richard Simpson burn all copies. Uh, I don't. Divide. I'm not <laughs> saying burn all of the copies <laughs> because people people need to be able to learn. From their past mistakes, <laughs> uh, you need to be able to stay. So. I don't, you know, it's not. It's like I'm gonna get like Stephen Bonacore still after me. He knows where I live now, <laughs> you know. So it's like it's only a matter. Of, it's only a matter of time before I kind of get you know smacked around the back of the head with some big kind of they find kind of orangey brown kind of paint flecks in the back of my skull where it was cleaved, <laughs> um, you know. Um, not if they use the kind of the not if they use the tableau boards though, because then I'll just get a paper cut, <laughs> boom tish. Um, so there you go. Um, but there's a mar- I mean, there's a market for that. I mean, I've seen people that offer kind of like pimped up components on. Um, they offer them on Etsy or Etsy or whatever Etsy. it's called. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They've seen them all kind of. Sorry, yeah. I had um, we we had the game photosynthesis. Yes. Um, in one of our board game crate um, boxes that came through. Mm. And it's absolutely stunning, the look of the game. But there was a tiny, tiny mechanical issue with some of the trees. They were um, like two-part cardboard trees that you slot together. Mm-hmm. Um, and they stand up really nicely. But I think it was the blue ones were particularly prone to not fitting together very tightly. Yeah. So you go to pick it up and you'd end up holding half of it and the other half would have fallen out the bottom. So I, I, I made some little cardboard uh, crosses to, to glue onto the bottom of the trees to hold them together mm-hmm. and posted a picture on um, BGG. Um, and there was one or two people who expressed an interest in buying them. Wow. Um, so I went through the process of trying to figure out how to list something like that on Board Game Geek, and it, was, it proved to be a bit too... Too onerous to, to get a listing together, um, but I, I, there is there is a market for some stuff like that. But when when you look into it, there's people three D printing all kinds of component improvements and things. It's a, it's not an empty market. There's lots of people out there doing it. I think there'd be nothing nicer than a bit of handmade stuff. Something that you know has had a little bit of kind of TLC to it. Not that I'm saying 3D printing stuff isn't just a case of, I mean, there's a lot of work that goes into that. Yeah. But, I mean, I couldn't think of anything cooler than maybe the full, a kind of a fully pimped out, like, Everdell tree 
from that oh, wow. game <laughs> sure. to just kind of sure. sit, sit, sit the side. I mean, that would be pretty cool. And I mean, joking aside, you know, you know, while I do adore terraforming Mars, um, I th- you know, I really like all the little kind of when they're doing kind of like the biodomes and you know everything like that. I've seen a like a fully pimped up version of that a couple of times online, and it does look really, really cool, and it can add. A kind of a lot of additional stuff to the kind of the game, you know. Yeah, I, I saw somebody done um, sort of 3D tiles for Gloomhaven. Um, oh, wow. Which um, which really made the rooms look like rooms. It was, uh, it was really nice stuff, but obviously, um, it's such a massive game. And we, we, we do have Gloomhaven, we've got uh, about 10, 10 or 12 scenarios into it. Um, well, I can't imagine adding setup time to it. No, <laughs> having having to build the rooms first. I'm sure there'd be some nice. people that would just have it kind of laid out on the table, kind of ready to go. I'm pretty sure that there are people that that's what they do on a week by week basis. They just have oh, well, a gloom kind haven of, room. yeah, Gloomhaven or <laughs> um, something like Kingdom Death Monster, or you know, even their D and D campaign. They've kind of got them laid out in a big, huge. Um, uh, kind of tile, kind of kind of set up. Um, yeah, yeah. I know that. Um, I know that. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, there's th- this seems to be kind of like the secondary market now, where you get like a, a game and people are like, "Well, I kind of like what I'm doing, um, but I'd like to make it kind of all kind of shiny and nice and wonderful and, and kind of new." So, so what we're also saying here is if um, if you want additional shiny stuff for your board games <laughs> then go, obviously go, send, go your I- it, send your ideas <laughs> to Pete and no. some and some money yeah and it's do you know what I mean it could be called um, pimp your games while you wait uh, except genius. obviously a shorter name that's a bit more catchier and not as rubbish of, as what I've what I've kind of just what I've kind of just said um are there games you'd want to get your hands on? I mean, is there anything? I know you say you're quite selective with the games that you play, but are there games that you currently would say, well, actually, I'd just like to kind of have this one just to kind of have it and just to kind of muck about and then just have it kind of thing? Well, there's, there's always a wish list of games. It's uh, been never, never short of games that you want to get hold of. Um, yeah. But I got... I wasn't sure about Wingspan, to be honest. Um, but I, I am warming to it quite a lot. Uh, I, would, I would quite like to, to get out of that. Yeah, uh, Wings, Wingspan's quite funny. Because I've heard it's kind of like... I, I'm starting to hear people going, oh, it's not as good as it is. And I'm still hearing people saying it's one of the best games I've kind of like played in a long time. And I don't know if people were kind of getting it because it was the brand new hotness and not because they were sitting down and having a calculated kind of, do I like this type of game? Is this going to be suitable for me and my group? They've kind of went, oh, Wingspan, I can get it here. And they've got a copy and then they've played it and they've had a little bit of buyer's regret because it maybe wasn't the kind of game that they should have been, that they would normally play anyway, you know? Yeah, yeah. I've heard heard that it's not um, a, a particularly gamerly game if you like yeah um, it's a very accessible game for sort of anyone can learn to play it sort of thing but um, I don't know I, I haven't rushed out and bought it um, uh, which which I don't know it, I, I, if I was if money was no object I'd, I'd probably get it but it, it's it's on it's on the list but it's nowhere near the top um but I'm I'm extremely uh, tight when it comes to to <laughs> buying games as well. Um, I can't I can't bring myself to pay um, full price for much um, much stuff of anything really. So I'll, I'll meticulously research the cheapest place to get things from. Um, I think that's par for the course. I mean, I've gone as far as I mean, um, companies like um, Games Law. For instance, I get their oh. newsletter, um, and they have an actual damaged stock section. Ding and Dent or other people, they have like damaged stock and Zatu. And occasionally, I'll look over it, and it's like, 
and they'll put up a photograph of what the game looks like and it's like they say, no, it's a slight damaged one. But from the ones I've been sent that they're so-called damaged in inverted commas, <laughs> they've got like a slight press at the side or something like that. They're, they, they can't they can't send it out saying it's a brand new copy because it's got a slight s- scrape on it or a slight dent in it or something like that. And they, they sell these at kind of like... Um, Lots of money off. And let's face it, Pete, I mean, we're looking at things that are costing kind of 40, 50 quid a shot. So, you know, in the lower end of the market, I mean, I've seen, you know, you, you know, I mentioned this before. I mean, it's a chunk of money to be going out. So I know why people are kind of like, I'm quite pretty selective myself on kind of what I, what I pick up and kind of what I buy, you know? Yeah. 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 Of course. It's um, I mean, a lack. We don't have a, a great deal of disposable income these days. No. Um, so, our, our purchase. That's why I'm. It's part of the reason why I'm fairly very selective because I don't. I don't really want to buy anything that's just going to sit on the shelf and collect dust. Exactly. So. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> However, I have a question. Okay. If, okay, down in Devon, okay. The ultimate argument is broken out between Devon and Cornwall, okay, about okay. the whole jam and scone and cream debate. And in a fit, in a fit of, in a fit of fury, the residents of Tipperton infect some cream with the zombie plague to force it okay. to their Cornish, their to Cornish friends. Who can't decide whether to put the jam on top or the cream on top? Unfortunately, the zombie plague infects its way all across and up through, up into England, and you yeah. have to escape. And okay. you're trundling away, and you yeah. find yourself. You have to escape from this oncoming zombie horde. Okay, is, is, is Ben Maddox driving the taxi? Or? <laughs> Ben Maddox is going to kill me for this because he's gonna, we've already had discussions about this, right? But you're not you're not like a designer developer, so it's fine. Um, and you end up in a board game shop, and you've got a choice okay. of any three board games. What three do you get? What three do you get? And you can have anything at all. Do you know? I've listened to so many of your shows. You'd think I would have prepared for this question. Well, I don't but, always bring the question out because obviously nowadays, you know, <laughs> as soon as I like mention it on an episode, I get a sideways glance from from Ben, <laughs> and you know, I've got <laughs> I've got what to for that. <laughs> Three games. Um, oh, um, I think probably grab a copy of Carcassonne. Um, Probably for nostalgic reason, reasons more than anything, because that was one of the first games that we we got into. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, it would be the big box edition uh, with uh, with all the expansions in it, and uh, uh, just for value for money. Uh, and then uh, I think we probably have to have uh, something like Time Stories. Um, oh yeah, okay. With all of the expansions, so of course, be, be of course, to play there. Okay. <sighs> and then looks at wife for inspiration. Gets none. Um, I'd probably say to you to Parkin. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, just. Uh, because it's a game that we've we've really just scratched the surface of. Um, uh, although I'm now thinking maybe Caverna. <laughs> you have to hurry. The door is getting banged on <laughs> by these brain hungry fools. Covered in poison clotted cream. C- covered in poison clot. It could be could be blood. It potentially is probably a lovely raspberry jam. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, oh, yep. Getting, getting a hint from the side. Seven Wonders Duel would be the problem. There, the, you, go. there, there you, go. you go. There you go. There you go. So you put them in your trolley, trundle off into the, the day, getting followed yeah. by some kind of ravenous, rebellious scorn. Yep, yeah, <laughs> and, and it's the back door of the. Um, 
back door of the car going to fly open as we go? No, 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 no. Come on. Oh, okay. Come okay. on. There's nothing to do with that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> I don't like this. I don't like this. I don't like this accusation <laughs> at all. Um, thank you very, very much for coming on. Oh, um, it's, my, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. I, uh, completely out of the blue. I wasn't expecting a, a little nobody like me to uh, to get to get anywhere near. So. Um, that's I, I, you're you're you know you're one of the reasons why we do the show. You're one of the reasons why everybody you know everybody does your show. You know you're. Potentially, I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, I could get like Jamie Stegmaier on the show, but there's no point in having anybody in the show if there's nobody listening. So you know, that's true. You're very, you know, and I really, really appreciate all the support, the kind words, the occasional kind of um, crass feedback, the shouting, um, <laughs> <laughs> everything like that that you've done. What about the the fan calls at two in the morning? Do, do that's, that, yeah, that's fine, and obviously the hip hop <laughs> tracks, which are absolutely fantastic. Um, <clears throat> If people want to find you on the internet webs, where do you exist on the internet webs if you want people to find you? Ooh, um, I'm on, I am on Twitter. Right. Um, I go by the name of Pedro underscore XXL. There you go. Um, <laughs> Is that your stri- was that your stripper name before you retired? <laughs> you, never, <laughs> you never worked in telecoms at all, you chap. <laughs> you cheeky scam. <laughs> Blown my cover now. Yeah. It was that Oil, oiled up and g-stringed up, and you know, <laughs> getting it down yeah. to some a bit of hot chocolate, you sexy thing. I'm um, gonna have to delete all those photos. Now. You're gonna yeah. have to delete your Twitter account at the end of this. <laughs> and uh, on Facebook, just with my my real name. Okay. Um, cool. But I don't have any uh, any websites or anything. It's um, fine. Contact Pete. Offer him money to do stuff. That's what that's what we're doing today. <laughs> um, if you want to contact me and offer me money to do stuff, <laughs> depends how much money you want to give us, because I'll do all sorts. Um, and unlike Meatloaf, I might even do that. Um, but if you do want to find us on the internet web, you can go to just search for We're Not Wizards. You'll find us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and our website and our blog. And um, you'll find us on Apple Podcasts and all the podcast catchers, which don't have pod or don't have cast in them, things like Spotify, you know. And uh, if you like what you've listened to tonight, there's a couple of things you can do. Tell somebody else, anybody else, even people you like or people you don't like, you know, doesn't matter. Um, but the other thing you can do is you go to go to Apple Podcasts and drop us a subscription and drop us a rating or a review. And if you, well, remember, don't give us 10 stars because that will make us big-headed. But don't give us one star. Because that'll make us cry. And Pete's seen what I look like, and he knows I'm an ugly crier. <laughs> Give us something in the middle, like a five. Because it's average, and it's a little, and we're just a little bit average. But the person who's not been average tonight is the rather wonderful, the rather fantastic. He's the trumpet playing, homemade monopoly, centre piece making star. You know, he may make you hesitate, but he won't make you wait. It's Pete Wait. Thank you very much, sir. Um, there's only a couple more things to do. The first thing is to remember that we're many things, but we're not wizards. Are we wizards? We are not. Yes, of course we're not. And the other thing is, to, and the other thing is to say goodbye. So say goodbye from Pete. Say goodbye, Pete. No, is he goodbye, here. Pete. He arrives precisely yes. when he And it's a good. <laughs> and it's a goodbye for <laughs> goodbye that's from me. That's a passage, you know. That is now to actually. Yeah, it has to be. I mean, folk, yeah. you know, folk that don't, say, you know, folk that don't say that nowadays. I just say, well, you obviously don't listen to the show, did you? <laughs> um, yes. And it's a goodbye from me. Remember, stay safe. Roll sixes. Make something awful. But until the next time, goodbye. <laughs>